In just four steps, anyone can enter. Anyone can leave. Or so it was once. I've been here since the house was built. And there's so much I've seen. Mostly now, I'm alone. But when the wind blows through the grounds of this estate, blows and whistles through the palm trees out front and the bamboo reeds out back, and brings with it the sound of serene water moving past the river plants, it's then that I feel suddenly alive. It's becoming breezy again. The air bears ribbons of voices. The words are clear yet distant like echoes. With them is memory. I know the year. I remember the day. August 1st. 1834. Mr. Sutton was standing on my lowest step. He was speaking to Maurice. From a distance drifted in the sounds of chanting and drums. So much to do for the wedding boy, no time off this week. Sorry. Soft voice, hard face. When you're done with those crotons, go down riverside. Clear the bushes and help Amity clean the eaves and the trains. There was silence. Silence. And then Maurice smiled. Is there a problem, boy? No idling. How often do I have to say that for you to understand? Are you stupid? Maybe I should have your damn tongue torn out. Then you'd have a reason not to speak. Maybe I'll have you chained and whipped. Sutton's hard laughter was painful to hear. Maurice laughed too, low, and spat, spat when his back was turned, and kept on snipping away, levelling the hedge. I flinched as the master stepped heavily up to the porch. From the sway in his gait, I knew he had already overindulged his evening habit of demerara rum. How else could he not think emancipation had come? The Montserrat Hills rise gracefully around the Grand Kufa estate in the centre of the island, offering a daily study in green. No shade of green tonight, but black, more black than the night sky that's lit with cold stars and a distant moon. Tonight, the wind comes in and gets trapped here by our hills. I wonder where it comes from. Africa? Or Europe? From one place? Or everywhere? The wind is fierce and heavy, loud and cold. It brings more voices, and I remember. Easter Sunday, 1833. Soft early morning song, a hymn drifting up from the barracks fifty yards away. When will they stop that blasted noise? Damn the Catholics and their kind hearts. The master was enraged that morning. Bastards, killing my property as if their offspring belonged to them as if they belonged to themselves. If I could prove it, Maurice would be hanged this instant. You'd think he'd be happy to have children, blessed with twins, heartless beasts, monstrous. Gunshots roared through the valley, but Sutton had the sense to point at no one. One bullet rushed through the edge of my bottom step leaving engraved lines. They buried three that day, the infants and their mother. I heard Emily talking to Cook that night, whispering against the rustling leaves. Marie's so brave, now they're free. If Sutton wasn't bad before, he gonna be bad now. All that talk they talking about this thing they call emancipation. Who could believe it? Rustling leaves, 
and water that flows through this land and through time. Voices from the past still linger. How can one not remember? August 1834. Emancipation came and what the master called apprenticeship began. He drank and cursed continuously and talked only of the English gentleman Miss Elizabeth Sutton was to marry, Mr. Arthur Charles Willoughby. Mr. Willoughby arrived, and he seemed to love the land. Each morning that week before the wedding, he came to the porch, stood, and looked around at the garden, then out into the distance. Sometimes Mr. Sutton stood listening, sometimes Elizabeth. No matter, he said the same. You have a sizable property here. Trinidad Cocoa fetches an excellent price. Teak and mahogany, too. Quite valuable. Such a wonderful island. With the right labour, we can make this place profitable again. Cocoa can make you a prince. And believe me, indentureship is a fine plan, because those people are a docile lot. We should soon be able to appoint a manager and return home. He stroked Elizabeth's hand, or he wound his fingers through her long hair. On evenings late, he held her close, his hands moving against the silk of her pale green dress, against her shoulders, up to her neck and cheeks. All the while, talking of the profits of the West Indies and the great estates that punctuated the English countryside. And she smiled to hear of acres of gardens, verdant in summer, and houses so large you'd get lost in them, and trusted servants who were white. I shared her awe. Could it possibly be so? English Perdesoir, sewn in England. English patent leather, stitched in England. Soaps, linen, shipped from England. England, England, England. English lanterns stood at my sides that Sunday evening. Out on the lawn were tables set up for the dinner guests. Torches threw shadows and light about the garden. A band from Port of Spain had come. Amelie, Maurice and Cook wore new clothes. I could not remember when last we had been so festive. Champagne from France and rums and wines were lavishly passed to laughing guests who danced or feasted as they pleased. I felt that Mr. Willoughby could be good for us. He himself was imperially dressed, and next to him, Elizabeth seemed more womanly than her seventeen years should permit. Her playful girlishness was gone. Around her neck he had placed a necklace, a jewelled collar, comprising three strands of magnificent rubies, and on her left hand, a ring of diamonds that clustered around the red stone. Her eyes were brighter and larger than ever. Mr. Sutton quieted his guests and began to speak. His voice grew louder and louder. Dear relatives and friends, thank you for coming to Montserrat this evening. Her dear mother, as you know, passed on when she was an infant. But Elizabeth has done us proud. The marriage between my daughter and this gentleman is truly an occasion for celebration. Looking at the couple, he continued. Elizabeth has dutifully, in fact joyfully, accepted my guidance to marry as I did, 
to look beyond this little island to the metropolis. I dare say there is no beauty in England more deserving of this gentleman than our princess. He turned his attention to his guests. Emily and Maurice were just done serving wine for toasting. Crystal champagne flutes sparkled in the dancing light. You know the dangers we face. Some of our children end up mixing with animals, with the type that would kill their own when they got the chance. But not my Elizabeth. Let's stand and lift our glasses. Arthur and Elizabeth, congratulations. He drank off the contents. Then gunshot blasted and glass shattered and we saw Mr Sutton fall. Women screamed. Maurice made a path through the cluster of guests and strode past the unmoving body. He grabbed a flickering torch from its base, leapt up to the porch and dashed to the ground the kerosene lamps from the pedestals. Mr Willoughby began shouting, Crazy fool, stop him, he'll burn the house down. But what could the guests do? Elizabeth, her voice shrill and wavering, spoke too. Get water, water, Arthur, we lose everything, I get buckets. Upward shot flames of yellow, red and blue, fierce and mesmerizing. The air was stunningly hot. People shrank back, but Elizabeth, oblivious to the inferno, ran alongside the house to the back. Her neck glowed red in the firelight. Mr Willoughby himself stayed long enough to deal with the funerals and to complete the legal arrangements. The estate belongs to his descendants, perhaps. But no one comes here now. No house left. Just four stone steps. Grey, hard and enduring. And the earth around. And the flowers and the trees that dare to spring up of their own volition. The barracks still stand, though and the mountains around have not changed. <laughs>